Hey all, welcome to Parker's Reefs. In today's episode, we're gonna talk about something a little bit geeky, but super important to the future success of this tank, and that's battery backup power. All right, thanks for joining me on this video where I'm gonna talk about battery backup and the whole decision process I've gone through for my dream reef tank here. Now, I've put some of the uh, chapter marks in the description or the comments down below. So if you wanna skip forward to any parts or skip back so you can listen to something again, feel free to do so by following those chapter indicators. Now, I'm gonna start off by talking about why I wanted a uh, battery backup. It's a fairly uh, straightforward question, but um, it's one that comes up pretty often. Now. Depending on where you are in the world, your power supply can become um, either very reliable or very unreliable. Now, fortunately for me, where I am here in uh, Victoria in Australia, our power is really considered to be very reliable. However, that then does have some drawbacks where when you haven't had a power outage at your house for a number of months or even over a year, you start to consider a power outage to be something like a unicorn, something that's never gonna happen. Now, over the last few summers, I've found out that that's not always the case. And we have had a couple of scheduled and unscheduled power outages that have lasted a few hours. Now, when I had my previous display tank here, every time there was one of those power outages, it was an absolute nightmare. I would rush home from work. I'd have to get into the house because the garage door was locked. So we had to work out a way to have a key because we normally come in through the garage door to have a spare key to get into the house, to then uh, get my battery powered air pumps into the display tank just to keep the water oxygenated. I'd even grab jugs and uh, pick water up and pour it out, pick water up and pour it out just to get a bit of aeration into the water, but also create a little bit of flow. Throughout those times, my next major concern was also temperature. Um, on some of those days, it was very, very hot when we had the power outages, like you're talking like a 44 degrees Celsius day with um, power outage, so there's no air con, no fans, and the heat just starts to seep in. Um, that was one consideration. The second consideration is, of course, your uh, plumbing. Um, whilst I put uh, siphon brakes and things like that, I know some people run check valves, all of these measures to stop the uh, display tank siphoning back down into your sump and overflowing, they don't always work, and um, I'm a big fan of siphon brakes. I did have one power outage where the siphon brake did not work for whatever reason. I don't know if there was some salt creep, a bit of coralline, something else, whatever it was, it did not break the siphon and my sump flooded onto the floor. So not only did I come home to a hot, dark house with nothing running that I then had to get our spare key out, get into the house, come in to find the floor wet, um, the display tank down to about that high of water, worried about when the electricity was gonna come back on because there's water over all the electronics. Absolute nightmare. So I find at a minimum, I wanna keep the return pump moving. I'd really also like to keep the um, skimmer moving to keep uh, the oxygenated water going. I'd probably also like, um, well, they're probably the two main things really. If I can keep the return pump going just for a little bit of water movement, skimmer going for um, the oxygenation, a wave maker or two just again to keep that water movement would be great. Anything else from there is a bonus, but um, maybe some light and at absolute worst case, if it's a really hot day, the ability to put the chiller on to keep the temperature, or if it's a really cold day, the heat is on so that I can keep the water temperature somewhat stable just to minimize losses of coral or fish. In fact, if I could keep return pump, skimmer, wave maker, and heat and chiller on, I would anticipate that the tank would solder on as if nothing was wrong. Even if the lights are off for a day, I really don't think I'm gonna lose any coral or fish from that. So that got me thinking about what I could do for uh, power backup for this tank. Now, having been in the hobby for a little while now, the most common solution I see is the uh, Ecotec battery backup, which is a great little unit, very plug and play, works nicely if you've got uh, Vortec pumps or if you're running a uh, Vectra return pumps, you can get boosters and things, you plug them in there and they'll just automatically switch over. Good little units, but they do kind of lock you into using their equipment, which is fair enough, I mean, Everyone's gonna make a dollar, that's fine. You can adapt them to work with other bits of gear. I find once you start adapting them a little bit, you're kind of heading down the DIY path anyway. So, plus we're talking, uh, that would be good for a return pump and uh, potentially a, um, a, wave, a wave maker or two. The time they'd run for, they're only fairly small batteries in there. I'm talking about uh, skimmers, um, wave makers, return pumps, heaters and chillers. I don't think the, um, 
the, the Vortex going to do the job. I know you can daisy chain them and it's a totally viable option, but uh, once you buy, say, four, six, eight, 10, 12 of them, the price starts really getting up there. So I'm going to rule the Ecotech battery back up out, but it is a good option for smaller tanks or people that are less comfortable in DIYing or going another path. So that got me thinking about a bit more of a, um, a wholesome solution, something that would uh, tackle the entire problem. So not just powering the tank, but powering the entire house. That was the ultimate dream goal. And we're talking about my dream reef tank here. So I started looking into things like the Tesla Powerwall. And as a big Elon Musk fan, that was a path I really wanted to go. Unfortunately for me, and it is just for me, it didn't quite work out to be the best solution for me. Mainly being that we already have solar in this house. We've got a five kilowatt solar system already in the house. We've had it for about, I think about eight years now. So it's a reasonably well aged system. And the Tesla Powerwall is its own solar inverter with battery backup in there. So I would effectively be removing our current solar inverter to be putting the new Tesla Powerwall inverter and battery backup in there, which means I'd be wasting quite a bit of electronics that we've paid quite a few thousand dollars for which is just not a very viable option. The second part of the problem there is a lot of the time, particularly where I live in Victoria, Australia, the prices quoted on the Tesla Powerwall include subsidies. So if you're new to get solar, you can get the Powerwall at a certain price because it includes government subsidies to bring that price down. If you already have solar, you cannot get subsidies. Well, as far as I'm aware, you cannot get subsidies to replace the inverter with something else, which kind of meant that we were gonna be paying full retail price. Now to switch out our current inverter to add a Tesla Powerwall, including the transfer switch so it could continue to power the house in the event of a power outage. We were talking around the 15 to $20,000 mark, which I must admit, I was still relatively keen on doing it, despite being a lot of money for the fact that it would power our entire house. There was one more little catch that uh, when I looked into a bit further, I realized that it just wasn't gonna quite meet my needs. And that is that the Tesla Powerwall isn't really designed to be a battery backup. It is designed to be a battery, but not so much as a backup. It's designed to absorb the excess solar generated or the excess power, I should say, generated throughout the day, and then use that at night rather than drawing from the grid. And it's basically really, its primary purpose is to deplete that power completely throughout the night and then charge it back up during the sunlit hours the next day. If you wanna use it as a battery backup, if I wanted to store some power in the event of a power outage for this tank, it has the ability to do so. I'd have to put in a percentage or a, um, an amount of power that I wanted to keep as battery backup and it would then limit, it would always keep that state of charge available. So if I said I wanted to keep 50% of the battery as a backup for this tank all the time, when the sun set and the house started to be charged or started to be powered by the Tesla Powerwall, we would never go below 50% of that battery because it would always need to keep that backup available for this tank. That then drastically reduces your return on investment on that system because you're not getting the full discharge and charge every day, making the Powerwall even more expensive. And as soon as it's a sliding scale, as soon as you make that backup capacity smaller to try and increase your return on investment, you end up with a fairly small battery backup, still with that big outlay of cost at the front. So with all these factors combined, the uh, Tesla Powerwall or Powerwall 2 wasn't gonna work for me. All right, the next solution that I stumbled across, and I've seen a couple of reefers do this in Australia and also overseas, and I was certain, absolutely certain, this was the solution for me. It was the Generac or other, but I was personally looking at the, the Generac whole house gas generator. Now this is an incredible device. It plugs into, or I say plugs, it plums into the gas supply to your house and it plums it, it wires into the, uh, the power supply for your house. In the event of a power outage, it automatically turns on the generator, hard plumbed into gas. You don't have to have gas bottles or um, gasoline fuel there. It plums into, your, uh, into the, your house gas supply, which doesn't normally have outages. I know there has been one in Australia like 15, 20 years ago, um, in, in Victoria anyway, when there was a problem with the um, gas supply, but the, uh, re unbelievably rare. You just about always have gas available on tap plumbed to your house. So as soon as there was a power outage, that thing turns on the generator, brings it up to speed, gets it warm. Then the transfer switch kicks over and it supplies your whole house with electricity for as long as need be, basically, because you've got gas supply on tap. It could run for days, weeks, months, years. 
with your power out, supplying the whole house with power. Now that to me sounded like an absolute dream. I was thinking we'd have the air con running, it'd have the TV on, the fridge is keeping my beers cold, and most importantly, the whole fish tank just keeps on running, no problem at all. I had a look into these units, super, super keen. They're not that expensive to purchase. Um, you're talking uh, around $8,000, $10,000 to purchase a unit the size to um, power your whole house. Not an issue there at all. Um, well, it's not an issue. Considerable amount of money, but I, I had factored for it and I was prepared to spend that. In fact, I even bought a unit on under the um, guidance from the seller that to install it in our location, we're probably talking about a three to $4,000 install cost. Fast forward a few weeks, um, once I started to get some quotes to install that unit, and uh, the quotes were nowhere near that. The cheapest quote I got was $18,000 to install this unit, and the dearest quote I got was $22,000 to install the unit. Now, I, I don't know how much of that was uh, price gouging, how much of that was red tape, or how much of that was real. I don't know. I know um, interstate, some other uh, Marifas have been able to get these things installed for a couple thousand bucks. The location where I was putting mine was right next to the gas mains and right next to our switchboard, which should have made the installation quite cheap and simple, but um, I was told otherwise, and hey, I'm not an electrician or a gas plumber, so I can't really um, question these things. All I know is that with the price of $8,000 for the unit, an extra $1,500 for the transfer switch, and then $18,000 to $22,000 to install it, it completely ruled that option out for me, um, which was a real shame because that did look like a fantastic option. The only problem with it is it is a generator. It does make noise. Um, not that it's a really big deal. They're fairly quiet. Um, and it's obviously only really gonna be running during a power outage, which like I said, is fairly rare. The, the big advantages to the system is that it powers your entire house. It can last basically indefinitely. It just sounded like a great unit, but again, unfortunately, not for me. All right, well that then started leading me on to the next option, which was the DIY or UPS style system where um, you basically purchase a number of batteries. You uh, have a uh, charger, um, an inverter, and a transfer switch or relay to basically control when your reef tank is drawing power from those batteries or from the grid. It's a pretty basic relay that uh, when the power goes out, the relay should switch and it should divert power to draw from the batteries, power your inverter. You can even get inverters that will have a, a battery charger, a transfer switch, and an inverter all built into one. So you basically buy your inverter, buy your battery backup, happy days. And once I started looking into some of these DIY options, I sort of got led down the rabbit hole into some really, really cool options. And I even came across um, a couple of installs that uh, the fantastic team up at uh, Gallery Aquatica have done, and they've got a brilliant YouTube channel. If you haven't checked it out yet, check out Gallery Aquatica TV. Cam and Arnie do a brilliant job on that channel. Now, they'd installed a couple of these really hardcore DIY um, battery backup solutions using Victron um, inverters. And once I started looking into those, I was absolutely sold. Victron's a uh, well-respected brand. It um, produces high quality gear, very underrated in its uh, specifications, which is always pleasing. I know it's the same deal when you're looking at um, reefing equipment. If you've got a pump that says it can do a thousand gallons per hour, but you know that it can do that with its eyes closed, or a skimmer that says that it can do um, a tank volume of 5,000 liters, when realistically it's probably pushing things at about 800 liters. Specification, um, truth stretching means a big deal to me. So when I saw that the Victor and Inverter um, has the ability to go well beyond its specifications, I knew it would be a quality bit of gear. I had a look on YouTube, funnily enough, to have a look at some reviews. People very, very happy with them. Ironically, it seems like the, the, the case or the scenario that these units are basically designed for is for either motorhomes, um, camper vans, uh, houseboats, things like that, where uh, you can dock into power. So when you uh, arrived at a, um, a caravan park or you arrived on, um, on in a, a dock or something somewhere, you can plug your, uh, your camper van or your boat into mains power and your whole vehicle will run off that mains power. It'll also charge the batteries so that when you unplug from that mains power, it automatically switches over to charge everything from the batteries and it then directs the power. Instead of coming from the grid, comes from the batteries through your inverter and still onto the um, appliances without you having to physically unplug or plug in anything. 
that sounded ideal to me. Um, when I saw that um, Gallery Aquatica had installed a couple of these into uh, reef tank situations, I figured I'd better look into them a bit further. And that's what's led me to my solution, which is a uh, sealed lead acid battery bank with a Victorin inverter. So let's talk a little bit further about that. All right, so onto my solution. Now I've decided to go with a Victorin Multi Plus 2 the 48 volt unit, and I'll discuss why I chose the 48 volt unit over the 24 or 12, and I've got the 3000 watt capable inverter. Now, what is this unit, what does it do? Basically, it is that type of um, all-in-one device I spoke about before, where it is a uh, battery charger, so it automatically charges the battery back up when the grid power is supplied. It is a transfer switch, so when the power does go out, it automatically switches over from the grid power to the battery power so that I don't physically even have to be here or I don't have to switch anything over. It'll automatically keep this fish tank running. And in fact, it does it that quickly that I'll get some footage of how quickly it switches over. It does it with an interruption of I think 10 or 20 milliseconds, which is within specs to keep computers and everything's running like that. And when you see the footage of how quickly it transfers over, you cannot even see a flicker in the um, lights. The, uh, I'll hook up a um, internet streaming speaker. It doesn't lose Wi-Fi connection. It does it that quickly that there is absolutely no interruption to power to the tank. The other thing that it does, which I really like, is this power assist function, which basically means if the grid is not supplying enough power, it will boost it with power from the batteries, which will be super handy when we focus or when we face things like these brownouts, which can be really, really hard on electronics here in Australia. If our main supply drops a little bit, the Victorin is going to pull a bit of extra power from the batteries to make sure it holds that perfect AC voltage. Oh. And finally, it is an inverter. So obviously it takes DC power, converts that to AC power and puts that into the grid to the fish tank. So these three devices or these three functions are all combined into one device, which makes it much, much easier to uh, set up, maintain, install and size all appropriately. Now, with the 3000 watt unit, I can go for a 12 volt system, a 24 volt system or a 48 volt system, they will all provide 3000 watts of power. That's no problem at all. The advantages of going for one of the lower voltage systems, such as a 12 volt, is that you can run basically any number of 12 volt batteries you want off that. You can run one 12 volt battery, you can run two, you can put them into, um, into uh, parallel, you can run three, you can run four, you can continually add on individual battery, individual 12 volt batteries to bulk up that 12 volt circuit. When you go up to a 24 volt system, if you're gonna use 12 volt car batteries or your traditional 12 volt battery, you're gonna to need to put two batteries in at a time because it needs to run at 24 volts. And likewise, when you go to a 48 volt system, you need four batteries. And if you wanna run more than four batteries, you're gonna really need to run eight batteries or 12 batteries because you're gonna to need to keep it in clusters of 48 volts. Now that sounds like an absolute pain because you may not want to run four batteries. You may just want one car battery or two car batteries to power your tank because that's a fair bit of power. So what's the benefits of going for the 48 volt system? Well, basically it becomes a little bit of, um, a little bit of maths and I guess physics perhaps um, to calculate how you convert uh, voltage from DC into AC and the amps and watts and current and things you're flowing basically to, because I'm not um, an expert on it and from the reading I did, it was explained to me that the higher your DC voltage, the less current flow through those battery cables you're gonna need to convert it into the same wattage in AC. So if you've got a 12 volt system that you're gonna try and run 3000 watts through, you're gonna need some huge big DC cables, otherwise it's gonna overheat and potentially be dangerous. Where if you go up to 24 or ideally 48 volts, with your higher voltage, going starting, higher starting voltage, your currents to get up to the AC voltage is not as hardcore. So I figured I'd go safety first, and it's also, Technically, it's also slightly more efficient converting from 48 volts into the uh, AC220 than it is from 12 volts. I figured once I had a look around and I decided I was probably gonna go for a four battery size backup anyway, that we might as well go the 48 volt system and that will give me a little bit more uh, safety and a little bit more efficiency down the line. So that's why I've gone for the 48 volt system. Now, the batteries I chose, I had a good look online, have a look to see what was gonna be the best deal. I had a look locally. I eventually came up with uh, Aussie Solar and Batteries, which um, have a great uh, website online. They have some really good quality, high capacity batteries that were ideal for this situation. 
They sell them in bulk packs, so you can buy like two of them for a discounted rate or four of them for a discounted rate with free postage. They include a very, very good warranty, which is a sliding scale warranty. Within the first year, if anything goes wrong, they replace them completely. In the second year, if something goes wrong, you've got to pay 20%. In the third year, if something goes wrong, you've got to pay 40%. 60%, 80%, and it gets to the point when something goes wrong after five or six years with a battery, you've got to pay full cost if you want to replace them, which is fair enough. For a battery technology like that, I actually thought that was really, really good because um, a lot of people are thinking these batteries will only last two or three years when they're covering them really for five plus years. Now, if I get five years out of them, I'll be very happy. But the best thing about it was this battery backup system, the batteries themselves are only $1,100 Australian, which was what I thought to be very, very good value. These are 440 amp hour, 12 volt batteries. So they build up 140 amp hour, 48 volt pack, which works out to be around about seven kilowatt hours or very similar to an original Powerwall or half the capacity of a Tesla Powerwall 2 for much, much less money. Now the inverter itself, I also picked that up online. Not that expensive either either, especially considering it's a high quality Victor in unit. I picked it up for $1,400 with um, free delivery. So, so far we're looking at two and a half thousand dollars. Then there was a little bit more to install it. My um, electrician, some of the um, battery leads, some of the, trend, uh, the, the isolation switches and uh, uh, circuit breakers and things like that all to keep it all compliant and legal. That was an extra 500 bucks. So all in all, the system came in at $3,000 Australian, but it's completely away from the tank. I don't have uh, batteries and wires and, um, or I don't have to have a generator with a lead and I don't have to be here. If something goes wrong, automatically switches over, keeps this tank running, happy days. All right, the next thing I get is how do you calculate how long that's gonna work for you and how do I go about sizing batteries for my own personal battery backup? And that's a really good question. It's something I thought was completely um, black magic before I didn't know how people worked it out. Now, thankfully I watched some YouTube videos and I came across um, how we work out the um, calculation where we've got uh, to work out your runtime, you need to multiply the amp hours of your battery pack, the voltage of your battery pack, the number of batteries. So if you've got, um, like my instance, I have 140 amp hour batteries. They are 12 volt batteries, but I have four of those batteries. So we do 140 times 12 times four multiplied by the efficiency factor. Now this is where when you're converting from DC to AC and there's a little bit of heat generated and you've got a little bit of loss through some of the cabling and stuff like that, to be realistic, we're gonna multiply that by 80% just because we're gonna lose a little bit of efficiency. You can't just move power from here to there and expect it to be all whole. It's just one of those things. All right, so you've got uh, amp hours multiplied by voltage, multiplied by number of batteries, multiplied by your efficiency factor, divided by your consumption. Now, consumption is one of those things in watts that um, it's gonna vary a lot. If you just wanted to run a return pump, you're gonna be, you should be able to see how many watts your return pump is. I've allowed 50 watts in my return pump. If I wanna run the skimmer, it's gonna be about another 50 watts or up to 100 watts. If I wanna run um, a couple of wave makers as well, we might step up to about 150 watts or 200 watts. Then when I wanna add something like the chiller, we might go up a thousand watts or 1500 watts. If I wanna run some lights, that might then take me up to about 2000 watts. So what I did was I came up with a little uh, spreadsheet and I'll put that on screen now. So you can see, depending on the number of watts I'm consuming, it'll tell me the number of hours that uh, my situation or my scenario, my setup is gonna last for. And you can see on those uh, real low level things where I'm just running a return pump and a skimmer, I can get multiple days out of that battery backup. If I'm running pretty much everything on the tank, I'm gonna get a few hours out of it. So I figure what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have a good percentage of items running on that battery backup circuit. And then if there is a power outage, I'll be notified because I've got um, some other devices that will tell me when there is a power outage that will then let me know whether I should switch off those extra devices. So sometimes when we get planned power outages here, or even if they're unplanned, we get a notification to say the power is out and they'll tell us roughly an ETA of when they think it will be back on again. If we're talking, it's only gonna be an hour or two away. I might leave most of the devices on. If it's a um, doomsday and we're talking days, I'll switch everything off except the return pump and skimmer and maybe one wave maker so I can get a few days out of the battery backup. Of course, in that time, I could always grab a um, generator or something and charge the battery backup in place at the same time, but it just gives me the ability to have 
the majority of the tank continue to run as per normal in a short power outage and give me some time to decide which devices I can switch off if they're less critical. All right, you've heard a little theory. I guess it's time for me to um, put some devices onto that circuit and uh, take you out and show you the system and then um, we'll flick the transfer, or I'll, I'll flick off the AC power supply to this circuit and we'll see the device switch over, go to inverter mode, power the circuit off the batteries and I'll plug a couple of things in here and leave one camera out here so you can see how the tank or how those devices respond when the power is out because I've done it a couple of times now and I've every now and then I manage to see when I have a, um, an incandescent bulb, I can just see a little flicker in it. Uh, when I run something that has like an LED or something that has a bit of a power pack, you don't see any interruption at all. So I'll plug a few devices into this circuit and we'll go uh, flick the power and see what happens. All right, so I've plugged a few things into the circuit. I've got an incandescent bulb. I've got a Orphic OR3 light bar back there. I've got a Sonos uh, internet streaming speaker. Main reason why I plugged this in is I wanted to see if there's an interruption to the Wi-Fi with the quick transfer and power from the power outage. I feel like that's probably gonna be the most obvious thing if something goes wrong. Maybe we'll see a little spike in power here. And then I've just got a fan as well, which I better switch on. Uh, that way. All right, so hopefully you can see the fans going. I'll turn the volume of the speaker up. I'll go transfer the power and we'll see what we get. Two seconds. All right, hopefully you can see the uh, light bar stayed on, the incandescent bulb stayed on. Most importantly to me anyway, the uh, internet connection from the smart speaker stayed on as well. There's no interruption whatsoever. And of course our fan's still running. So all in all, that's currently running off the battery. The, oh, and also the uh, light in the Himali sump, that's all running off the battery backup circuit. And on the, the power draw from this, it'll do so for a couple of days. So um, all in all, I'm pretty happy with that solution. All right, here is the inverter. You can see we've got um, the charger. So it's saying mains is on and uh, it's only float charging the battery. Now, my battery pack is down under here. I've got a little, uh, little uh, door in front of it and uh, my four batteries are in there. Battery supply comes up through this uh, isolator here. If I want to switch the battery pack off, I can do so there. Then comes through a fuse over here, which I've got a spare fuse just in case Something goes wrong there, up into the inverter. The DC, sorry, the negative side also comes, but it comes from the other direction. Now, the AC supply comes from my grid. It comes through this switch here. I can isolate the AC here if I want to. Comes into the inverter, then back out of the inverter through to the other side over here, which is where our uh, switchboard is. And via my um, main fish tank circuit there. Now, to test the uh, battery backup, all we need to do is open this here and switch off the mains, which you'll see instantly this will switch over to inverter. And now we're running on battery. To keep this system compliant, my electrician has kept the uh, circuit breaker in the switchboard, which will control the um, if there's any problem with the circuit when it's powered from the grid. And then we have uh, this one here, which will prefix, will, uh, we have this circuit breaker here, which will uh, protect the system when it's running on battery, but then pushing um, AC grid back into that circuit. So we have to do a little bit of uh, back and forth here with wiring to keep it all completely um, safe and legal, but uh, obviously it's worth it to make sure that um, we've got a good uh, circuit breaker on every scenario that this inverter can be running from. So safety first. The 
um, oh, so I'll open that back up, I'll switch the um, AC supply back on. You'll notice that when you switch it back on, it doesn't automatically switch back to mains. It does actually wait a second to make sure that the mains is stable. It keeps running the inverter for a little bit. And then in a second, we'll hear a click and we'll see the light switch to go back over to, um, back over to uh, mains. And there we have it. So the mains has come back on. That short time didn't even uh, bring the battery charger up from float. It's still saying the battery is 100% full. If they were to uh, drain a little bit, it would go into absorption. And if they had drained a lot, we'd go into bulk. But um, we're pretty good. It's all uh, safe and sound there. So yeah, there's the system. There's my um, solar right next to it. So this is all kept in the garage. All right, guys, there you have it. That's the wrap up of my, uh, I guess you'd call it a DIY slash semi-professional battery backup. I'm super happy with it in short. Um, for what it cost me, uh, we're talking just maybe a touch over $3,000, no more than $3,200 to be um, fully installed, to have a uh, very, very large capacity battery backup that's completely automated. The charging of it's automated, the switching of it's automated, The um, when the power comes back on, it's all automated. And it's not situated at my tank. It's got the wife appeal. It's tucked away under a shelf in the um, garage. All the electronics are all safe. They're all compliant. Everything's all good. And I think for um, the amount of runtime I'm going to get out of this system, the convenience factor for the price, I personally could not think of anything that remotely got close to it. Now, I did mention that if I had, if I had the money or I found a, um, a reasonable installation quote, I probably would have gone the Generac gas uh, whole house generator because... Literally in the title, it is a whole house generator. So uh, things like the beers, the TV, and the reef tank would keep on during a power outage. However, it did come with a whole heap of downsides. Plus, I just personally could not get an installation quote that was anything short of a decent priced car. So I just couldn't afford the money on that. I've ended up with this solution. I think it's turned out brilliant. Um, if you have any questions at all, uh, feel free to pop them down in the comments section below. If um, you think I've got something wrong, because like I've stated a few times, I am not an electrician. I'm not an expert in this field. I did a fair bit of research, but um, if I've got something wrong in any of my calculations, please do let me know. And um, as always, if uh, you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up because that lets the uh, YouTube algorithm know that you thought it was a good video and other reef enthusiasts should watch it also. And last but not least, before I let you guys go, if you're yet to subscribe, please consider subscribing. It's free, takes two seconds of your time. Just click the subscribe button down there. That'll go a long way to helping me out and I'd really appreciate it. Plus, it will ensure you don't miss out on any future videos about my dream reef tank build. Some of them may be a little bit more sexy than um, battery backups, but uh, hey, it's all important at the end of the day. Sometimes the devil is in the detail and uh, this is something that has bugged me for the, the last few years, every time we've had a power outage, which granted has only been one, maybe two a year, it's been an absolute panic for me where now I'm going to be able to sleep easy knowing that whether I'm at work, whether I'm on holidays, whether I'm sitting next to the tank, it doesn't matter. It's just going to soldier on, keep doing its thing. All of my beautiful fish and corals are going to stay alive and happy. And that's the main thing at the end of the day. Anyway, guys, I do have a tendency to ramble and this one has been going for a long, long time. So if you've made it this far, thank you very much. Uh, till next time, stay safe, keep reefing. Bye.